We're working from Life Sciences Paper 1 of November 2022. We're going to be looking at Section B, Question 3, and the total of Question 3 is out of 50 marks. And remember, in Section B, you're unpacking answers. You're doing a lot of explaining and describing, not just giving one-word answers. So let's start off now with Question 3.1. The first thing that you're asked to do is look at the picture which shows part of a human brain. Remember what I've always taught you. You don't go on to the questions yet. You look at that picture and you start unpacking it, familiarizing yourself with the different parts of what you're seeing and then you go on to the questions. So let's have a look at this part of the human brain. We see that we're looking at it in longitudinal section. Uh, let's orientate ourselves. We can see that here is the cerebellum at the back of the brain. So if we were to say, where's our eyes? The person is here looking forwards. So now we know that this is the front of the brain. And this is the back of the brain. And we see that different parts of the brain are labeled. And now that we know what we're looking at, let's start with the questions. 3.1.1 says identify part A. Remember where we see the word identify, we just want a name. It is only out of one mark, so we don't have to explain or discuss anything. We just have to identify. And if we look here, that is A, the part that I'm shading in now. That is part A. What is that part of the brain? Remember that you've got two hemispheres of the brain. You've got, not like in geography, a northern hemisphere and a southern hemisphere to the earth, but now we've got a left and a right hemisphere. And something holds those two hemispheres or the two sides of the brain together. And that is part A. And it's a tough piece of tissue it's, it's not going to break easily and allow the brain to fall apart. It's a very nice, tough area, and it is called the corpus callosum. All right, so here's your, your little bit of Latin for the day. Every time we see the word corpus, that translates to body. So, you know, in the uh, female reproductive cycle, in the ovary, you've got a corpus luteum, which is a yellow body. Here, we've got a corpus callosum, which means that it's a tough body. It's something really, really strong. So, you didn't really have to know that, but it helps to understand why different structures in our body might have the word corpus attached to them. It simply means it's a body. So identifying part A for one mark, corpus callosum. We have to explain, so this is out of two marks, which means we have to unpack it a little bit and use sentences, not just write one word, explain why a person may die if part C is damaged. Going back to our diagram, here we can see part C. And we can identify part C as the medulla oblongata. All right, now remember, your teacher might pronounce that as medulla instead of Medulla, all of these words are Latin in origin. So it's, it's how you read it and how you see it. And nobody expects you to pronounce the Latin as it should be pronounced. 
But sometimes the way that you pronounce it helps you to spell it. And if you pronounce that medulla oblongata, because it helps you know that there's a U, all power to you. You are learning life sciences, not Latin. All right, so why would a person possibly die? In fact, almost, yeah, almost probably die if the medulla oblongata is damaged. So remember, explanatory. So I would start off, if the medulla oblongata is damaged, what then? The medulla oblongata, remember, controls vital, very, very, very important uh, functions that are not under your control. These functions are involuntary, which means they carry on while you are sleeping, while you're not thinking about it, but they keep you alive. That's what we mean by the word vital. Very important and keeping you alive. And these functions are things like your heartbeat and your breathing rate, or not only the breathing rate, but the actual expansion and uh, collapsing of the chest area to allow for breathing to take place. All of these involuntary functions that keep you alive, you don't have to think about beat heart, beat heart, oh now I'm running, beat, beat, beat. Those functions are taken care of for you in an involuntary fashion by your medulla oblongata. So if the medulla oblongata is damaged, it means that essential vital functions that keep you alive will not be happening anymore. And that is why you would die. Part B is damaged in a person's lower back. First of all, we must name or identify part B. Go back to our diagram. What is part B? Part B is going to lie underneath or below the medulla oblongata and is going to go all the way down a person's back. So what is that structure? that is your spinal cord and the first part of 3.1.3 .3 is identify it so we write down spinal cord remember this is not your vertebral column this is not your backbone the words vertebral column apply to the bony structure that is protecting the spinal cord so Spinal cord is your answer because we're dealing with the nerve structures. And part B says explain why the person will have no control over the skeletal muscles of their legs. So you have your brain and your spinal cord as making up your central nervous system. And information from your legs right there's this person's legs information from your arms or in other words your upper limbs and information from your liver from your kidneys from all of the organs that you have gets fed to the spinal cord choose a different color here that information then goes up to the brain where it is processed the brain thinks about it and information comes back to these different organs sometimes the information simply goes to the spinal cord and the spinal cord can bring about an involuntary reaction which you've learned about as reflexes. So what we're saying now is what happens 
if the lower part of the spinal cord was damaged. Remember it said it's damaged in a person's lower back. So now this means that anything below, any organs below the point of damage are either not going to be able to send messages up to the brain or receive messages from the brain. That highway is now blocked. So why would the person have no control of the skeletal muscles of the legs? And our reason would be that the skeletal muscles of the legs feed their information into the spinal cord and either that information goes up to the brain or it stays at the spinal cord and comes out of the spinal cord uh, in a reflex action. So why would you have no control of the muscles? Because information either all the way from the brain or from the spinal cord itself is unable to get to the muscles of your legs and allow you to move your legs.